फिर से सारी बातें जो नहीं करनी थी कर डाली माँ All right, guys. Welcome back to the broadcast podcast. Uh, today, I'm I'm solo today without my brother.、Uh, it's just me, Nazar here, and today we have a very s- a special guest,、um, someone who I've been following for a while, who's re- recently blown up with his、uh, is with his uh, roomy um, uh, escapades.、Um, I have Muhammad Ali with me today. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm great, no problem. I've been following your work on Persian Poetics、um, on Instagram for about a few months now. Great.、Uh, it's been, it's been a really, it's been a charm. It's been lovely to see how、um, different the real poetry of Rumi is from someone right, like right. Coleman Barks is.、So、I myself am a writer. I've I've studied a lot of Coleman Barks stuff, and、um, it's just it's a pleasure to sit with you finally after seeing your. All of your、um, efforts sort of blow up in the way that、thank、it did、you. on Twitter to ha- finally have this conversation with you. So thank you for taking the time out. Thanks for having me. It means a lot. So I just wanted to like, jump right into the whole、um, thing that's been happening in the past couple of weeks.、Uh, we've seen an influx of retweets on the thing that you basically. I wouldn't say it's a story that you broke because we kind、mm. of people、right. kind of already knew. Like、um, whenever I would discuss Rumi with my father, who's also a big fan of Urdu poetry、yeah. and Persian poetry. I would sh- I would share、um, poet poems that a Coleman Barks had sort of translated or Coldplay had sort of incorporated in their music,、right. and then I would show him show them to him, and he would be like, "But where is the love of God that he talks about, or where、exactly. is the love of religion or Islam that he、mm-hmm. talks about?" That's sort of all watered down. Could you shed some light on on that aspect of Rumi's poetry? Like, what is all that about? Sure. So the first thing I'll say is it's interesting. You mentioned that a lot of people already knew about this, so a lot of people. Were tweeting at me the Rosina Ali、uh, New York Times article. I already read that、yeah. a long time ago. Actually, I read it in university. I mentioned the the Rumi thing to someone that I just noticed, and they showed that、yeah. to me, and then I explained, okay, this makes sense. So that was out there, but I think you know New York Times article. It's highly technical. I think the difference、yeah. was my thread kind of made it digestible. So if you're scrolling through your Twitter thread, everyone sees DiCaprio, sees Rumi. They're like, this is something's going on, and then it goes step by step to a way where、yeah. really even if you've only seen just one Rumi quote, you can get kind of what's going on. And it gave some examples too, because even the article it kind of talked about it. But I think it would have really helped drive the point on which I did on that is like showing the difference between what's like a more literal translation, even if it's not so poetic because it's so literal, but、yeah. what they're you know selling off as Rumi. But essentially, going to the love of God element, the main element of Sufi poetry is talking、yeah. about the love of God, or wanting to reach God, reach the state of you know ultimate.、Uh, they say annihilation in English. It's like an approximation of fana. We have in Arabic or、yeah. you know all the Islamic fana, languages,、yeah. right? Just being so encapsulated or taken over by the love of God that you're just gone. You know, you're not there anymore, and、yeah. uh, and that's a whole another discussion. But the idea is Sufi poetry, even if it seems like it's not about God, it's really about God. Yeah. So if it's talking about human love, it's a metaphor. If it's talking about wine, or if it's talking about whatever it could be talking about, it's all kind of a larger metaphor for one greater the idea, God, right?、Yeah. The love of God, exactly. And then in Sufism, we even break it down into ishqa hariri and ishqa majazi. Ishqa majazi. So、yeah. ishqa hariri is like a real love. It means like the love for God, and ishqa majazi is kind of like a fake love. Or like a、yeah. reflection of that,、It's、or more like more mortal love, like you、mortal、could love, sort of、exactly. incorporate it sort of into a、uh, romantic aspect of it, and Ishqa、exactly. Hakiki would be more of a immortal love, love exactly, of, for you、exactly. and the metaphysical, right? So ultimately, the beauty of Rumi's poetry is that he's expressed these ideas really well. I mean, there's hun- literally hundreds, thousands of Sufi poets, not just recent,、yeah. but in the classical tradition. But Rumi has really, you know, shown. And risen to the top of the, the, you could say the cream of the glass of milk. He's become the best because he just did it the best. Yeah, ultimately, he did the best. Yeah, agree.、Uh, of course, you know everyone has their favorite poet, but just generally speaking, you know, one the problem with these translations is when you read them, they've always kind of framed it so that the the writing is about a humanly love. So everyone、yeah. who reads Coleman Barks's work thinks that Rumi was just humanly in love with Shamsa Tabrizi. Yeah, and that's what this poetry was about. And that's what that the tweet actually went viral. Another tweet says, "My poems aren't about your boyfriend." And it's like Rumi <laughs> written by Rumi.、Yeah. <laughs> the only thing is, people have so badly misunderstood the point of the poetry, and this is、yeah. ultimately, I think, the fault of the translators who have not only changed the words to make it seem like it's all about people, but they've also failed to introduce the concept of you know, kind of like a small version of what、yeah. I just said. So yeah, this is the problem that I see ultimately with these translations. 
Um, so like I've myself was introduced to Rumi through like Coldplay's music. Uh, Chris mm. Martin is a big fan of uh, Rumi. He's mentioned a lot of his poems. He's referred to them mm. a lot of it of his poems in his songs. Uh, there's a poem by Rumi called "Conference of Birds." There's lyrics mm. in 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 Coldplay song "Ahead of Full of Dreams," co- referring to that. Mm-hmm. There's I would even go as far as saying um, there's a whole song on uh, Coldplay's uh, album "Ahead Full of Dreams" that Coleman Barks has r- narrated the um, the no poem way. the wow. guest house on it yeah they bought Incredible. rights for it it's a whole like Coldplay's music is behind it and Coleman Barks has narrated the whole poem the guest house on it right. wow. uh, when I went to see them live in concert they actually play that whole thing on the interlude which as as someone who had was not sort of like I was I didn't know what the backstory was that the translations were watered down I was I felt very proud in that stadium with 50,000 people there listening to the Rumi right. who we ha- hold as high regard as a saint Almost right. in Islam. So Coldplay um, also has Benny Adam. I didn't know this until I just translated Benny Adam uh, last night. <laughs> I did my own version of it finally. And Coldplay also has a song called Benny Adam, and it's in an album called Everyday yeah. Life, but it's also called Al Hayat Everyday Yomiya. Life. But it's also yeah. Like, so the, it's Coldplay's very re- to me. I didn't know Coldplay's. That. Coldplay's most recent. I would again. Chris Martin is a very big mm-hmm. uh, fan of Rumi. He's he considers himself a Sufi. So his r- most recent album, Everyday Life, it's called yeah, it's Hayat al Dunya. It's it goes. It, they actually went to Jordan and performed the whole album front and back uh, on Sunset and Sunrise. He has a lot of Islamic mysticism in his poetry. Wow. Like if you study um, Sufism and if you study uh, Rumi, you see those mm-hmm. those influences in his music. Someone like me who was who's grown up on Western music and and on um, Coleman Barks' work, do you th- do you fault us to us to us to a point because we did not sort of rise up to the occasion and sort of research Rumi ourselves, but we just took in what the white man was telling us or what the Western audience mm-hmm. was trying to feed into us? Is it our fault that Coleman Barks is the Coleman Barks' Rumi is what we know and not the version that right. Rumi intended? So I think this is, this is a cure. It's kind of hard to break this apart in a way. So first of all, I would say a lot of people, t- some people will go more extreme than me and take issue with Rumi being present in popular culture. I'm not against that. If Coldplay wants to incorporate yeah. even a Coleman Barks version of his music, that's fine to me. I think yeah. ultimately maybe someone will find Rumi and come to Islam. You know, some, some people who are yeah. Muslim thinkers today became Muslim because they read Coleman Barks. And I appreciate that. My issue isn't that Coleman Barks exists or that they're quoting Coleman Barks in their songs. Yeah. My issue is that Coleman Barks has dominated Rumi, period. He's become the Rumi. Everyone understands Rumi yep. through him. So my issue isn't that, that those things exist. Those are fine. My issue is that those are the only things, which is why I'm trying to you know write my own Rumi yeah. translation. But to uh, to say, yeah, I think that could be a positive element. You know, someone who's going to a, a, cult, a concert, someone who's Western, someone not from our background, but just has no understanding or inclination towards yeah. Islam. Maybe they'll fall in love with the album and say, where are these lyrics from? Who's Saadi Shirazi who wrote Bani Adam? Who's Rumi? Yep. And then maybe maybe they'll come across Jawad Mujaddidi's Rumi. Or maybe they'll go, yeah. they'll go to Konya or something. Or maybe they'll convert to Islam. So there's a lot of maybes and doors yeah. that are open. And we say, you know, everything is part of God's plan, inshallah. But as far as the onus of the person listening, reading, etc. Again, it's hard to say, you know, maybe some people just want to hear Rumi. They, they don't want to get into it too much. And if to the extent yeah. that it's in popular culture, they can absorb it. A lot of people in Iran are like that. For example, everyone in Iran knows Rumi and Hafez and Saadi, but they don't know, know them. They've just inherited them and absorbed them from popular culture. Like everyone yeah. can quote at least one line of Saadi, Hafez, Rumi respectively, right? Even a, yeah. a truck driver or something, a, a street sure, street. Yeah. Right, but that doesn't mean that they own the book or they've read it. So to that extent, you know, this might be similar in the sense that not everyone's going to look into it, right? Even people who can easily look into it, it's their fluent tongue, and the books are everywhere. They still don't. So as far as the onus on on us, I think us as you know Muslims living in America, we have a bit of a responsibility to make sure that if someone is interested in Rumi or if the society at large is interested, like we see, that we take the steps. So someone said, you know, Coleman Barks may have like built the first part of the bridge, right? We just have to keep building it. So I think it's great. If a lot of people like Rumi in America, I'm happy to hear that. But now we have to take the step to say, look, Rumi didn't begin and end in Coleman Barks. You haven't gotten to the room. That's like a a Rumi primer in a way, really. You haven't even actually started it. So I think if we can take advantage of that scenario, instead of seeing it as a disadvantage and seeing it as an advantage position, to, you know, yep. if, if we just had to say, here's Rumi, and no one even knew who he was, you know, no one yeah. might not have been interested. Then no, nobody right. would have been, yeah, nobody would have cared. So, inshallah, maybe one this of the is mo- the thing. Yeah. One of the most interesting things that I found um, on your t- Twitter thread, and then when I went more deep into the New York Times article, 
Um, the 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 poem that you quoted, the uh, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing right. and right doing, there's a field that will meet you there. The picture that you took was from a Khalid Husseini novel. Yeah. And Khalid Husseini quoted that. That was one of his epigraphs right. of his book. Um, Khalid Husseini being one of the biggest, one of the biggest, or if not the biggest Muslim writer currently writing. Um, don't you think? I felt like he sort of ha- should have had an, ex- like, sort of had the responsibility to, to sort right. of follow through with that. Like, if he was going to quote something, maybe because he, I'm pretty sure he's he's fluent in um in yeah, Persian. He be. Yeah, I would guess so. He should have gone out out of his way and sort of um maybe translated it on his own as opposed to quoting Coleman right. Barks all the time. Right. Um, and obviously a lo- a big hand on uh he had a big hand with the popularity of that certain poem which even brad pitt you said had it it had it tattooed on his pit um as as a writer myself what do you think what responsibility do you think we have to sort of prop like propel the poetry Mm. like i'm i'm pakistani so i hold ghalib and uh alam ikbal on high regard he's one of them they're one of the exactly like they're they're my teachers the pillars of of your intellectual tradition yeah yes so obviously if that were happening to ikbal or ghalib or any of those guys faraz i'd be pissed as well what what responsibility as a writer do i have to to so propel I, I say, I think first of all, you guys have been lucky that Iqbal and Ghalib have remained, you know, within our context. They're, they're not being yes. ruined just yet. Although when I made the the Rumi vodka thread, someone sent me an Iqbal wine. <laughs> so not an Iqbal, I'm sorry, a Ghalib wine. So okay, uh, yeah. So not Iqbal, but, but he himself Ghalib. was really known to like. Right, right. So I, I don't know. Maybe it's getting there. <laughs> But yeah. one thing I'll say is, luckily, you guys haven't been struck with the popularization translation. And I have actually a yeah. good friend who is, uh, his name is Shabir Abbas, and he's a PhD student at Columbia PhD candidate. And he's yeah. been translating Ghalib on his Facebook page. So, in- inshallah, I've been encouraging him. We'll get, we'll get him on a platform soon so that there yeah. could be good translations available. Yes. And that the translations that exist of Iqbal are good. So, but to wrap that up, related to the first question, I think ultimately the onus is on our elders. And that includes yeah. people like Khalid Husseini. So if we see a Muslim kid growing up and he reads Rumi, he yeah. has no context. He's not from a country where there's qawalis and, you know, music yeah. and quotes and the Maulidi is co- quoting Rumi and the Minbar and stuff. He's yeah. from America. She's from America. So it's up to our parents who are from that context who know the yeah. real deal to say, okay, if you're interested, let's work on our mother tongue. Let's let's yeah. at least get you, if you don't know the mother tongue, an English version that, that feels like what we read in the original. The onus is on our yeah. parents because ultimately growing up in America, what are we to know any better? You know, we didn't grow up with that, like uh, imbibed in our mother's milk. So that's true. Going to someone like Khalid Husseini, the onus is on people like him. So like you said, he knows Persian. He's from, you know, historical Persia. He's from modern day Afghanistan. He, yeah. he should have known that quote. He, I, I wonder if he even just copied it from Colin Barks without looking into it. I feel like he did because I, right. I read that quote in a, on the Big Red Book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he really should have known. And ultimately, I don't know, sometimes I find that the elders or the, the people who are kind of from that secular era of our countries actually yeah. support this stuff. So I should explain. So what I mean by secular era, you might have actually seen this on, on uh, Reddit with regards to Iran. It says, here's a picture of women wearing miniskirts in the 1970s in Iran and yeah. Afghanistan and Pakistan. Yeah. Look, here's women drinking beer before a certain yeah. you know ruler came. I won't get it too political, but a certain yeah, ruler yeah. came to Pakistan. There were women drinking beer in public, right? So yeah, yeah. there's this idea that there was this era, let's say like from 1950 to 70 in all these countries where it was like super secular. And yeah. a lot of these people fled for war reasons, because it got more religious, whatever, various reasons. These people have that nostalgia of that secular, you know, we lived like an Islam free the golden, life. Yeah, the, the, gold, golden the, the golden era. And if you go to like Los Angeles and Iran, you'll see that Iranians yeah. and Afghan expats are like that. And, you know, yeah. I don't know about other groups, but I, you run into people like this all the time from you do, Pakistan, yeah. Afghanistan, Iran. Yeah. So a lot of times these people, they actually support what Coleman Barks and these people are doing because to yeah. them they want everything secularized right yeah they have internalized Islamophobia I, I won't get too into it. I'm not a psychologist but yeah, yeah, yeah. ultimately all the hate that I got from this other than like trolls and like Nazis and because Twitter is full of weirdos <laughs> you know don't don't look at your Twitter mentions if you ever no, no. get a tweet with a lot of retweets the mo- majority of the hate that isn't just straight up trolling it's actually Iranian Afghan Pakistani uncles yeah. Who are messaging me stuff like, you're just one of the Molivis who ruined our country. Don't turn Rumi into a sheikh. Rumi was ha- against you guys. He, he hated religious authorities. Wow. And one guy literally messaged me 
I see that you're working on Hafiz too. You want you want to turn Rumi into a sheikh and Hafiz into a sheikh? He said, leave the an expert's job to the expert, and that's Coleman Barks. <laughs> so, and this was of so course, he's like some you even went guy. further and you said that Coleman Barks had never studied Persian and has never right, studied. Right, yeah. And so right. how how is he an expert in that? If, if that right, he, he, how did we allow him to do that then? Right, and that's the biggest thing is that people kept commenting. How did this happen? How did this happen? Yeah. How did this happen? And I said, we allowed it to happen. If you look yeah. at any community, if they feel like a line is being crossed with any yeah. regard, with regards to culture, their rights, whatever, they stand up as a group and say, no, absolutely not. You know, yeah. if what, no other community, I feel like would allow this. But we, for example, we are so desperate for the gaze of the Westerner. We want the yeah. white person to love us so badly. We want to be accepted so badly. That we're just like, if they just are interested in us, that's fine. And it doesn't yeah. matter how disrespectful it is, as long as yeah. they're interested. And I think ultimately that speaks more to us than to them, right? It's because it's yeah. our responsibility to be the custodians of, of these writings. And we failed to do that. So, you know, I just think that we need to be more vigilant as a group, as a, yeah. as a, as a society here. And I feel like this. with your point of we sort of... Um, are looking for the approval of the Western gaze. I think that has a lot to do with the colonialism and how, how we Absolutely. were like sort of uh, under the regime for so many centuries. And then once they, once they left, they sort of left this gaping hole. Mm-hmm. Of, and now we always look towards the West to see if, if we're doing something right. Or if, we, if we're right, if we're, you know, even if, even the art that we make, even everything like we're trying to sort of copy them or sort of rise to their, Exactly, um, standards. right, yeah. Well, and you can see this in the mindset. So some people who criticize will say, well, you know, n- not the uncles, they were more our age. Well, I acknowledge yeah. that this is not good, like a good translation, yeah. but at least it's popularized in the West now because that's yeah. their standard is that if it's the West likes. And I say, well, it was we were always reading Rumi. It, whether or not it's popular in the West, it's not skin yeah. off of our back and it's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, as inshallah, they'll all love it. But if they also, if they don't love it, that doesn't make it any different for us. You know, he was writing yeah. to speakers of these languages, right? Yeah. So anyway, I think we need to we need to stop this looking for the Western gaze and and to tie the colonization element back to specifically South Asia. You know, there's some parts of the Muslim world that are Arabic Arab yeah. sphere. You know, you could say from like Morocco to the the Gulf area up to yeah. Iraq, Syria. That's the yeah. Arabs part. Then yeah. from the Balkans through the Turkey to Iran to South Asia to Bengal, the Balkans yeah. to Bengal, that was the Persianite sphere. Yep. And I say the ite means not Persian. They weren't all ethnically Persian, of course. Persian yeah. ite means they were in the Persian tradition. Yeah. So their poetry was Persian. Their art was Persian. And this was just for various reasons, the Mughals, the Persian empires. And yeah. now when the colonizers came, they took away that language instruction of Persian. So yeah. back in the day, this is the, the most common thing I hear from people from South Asian heritage is when I meet them and say, you know, my grandfather spoke Persian because yeah. everyone who was educated in South Asia learned Persian, learned Arabic and Turkish. They learned Persian, learned Arabic. Yeah. So the colonizers came and they took away these languages. Now, the only places they remained is where Persian is the mother tongue, like Iran, Afghanistan, Tajikistan. But yeah. you guys, you know, I, I like to say this a lot to Iranians. The most Persian poetry volume, whatever you, however you want to measure it, was produced in South Asia, not in Iran. Yeah. So, but you guys, it wasn't your mother tongue. It was a, it was a learned thing. It was, a, it was just like a schooling thing. But then when they replaced the schooling of yeah. Persian with English, then you guys were cut off from that tradition. So that's yeah. why I get people messaging me all the time, letters from their grandparents. Here's a, the, my grandfather's first love letter to my grandma. It's in Persian. Can you translate it? Yeah. Here's my grandpa's diary. It's in Persian. Here's my grandma's last writing. It's in Persian. And it's like, I, and at first I was shocked. You know, I was coming from this very isolated Iranian mindset. I was at first shocked that I had South Asian fans. I didn't think they'd be interested <laughs> in how ignorant I was. And then all of a sudden, all of these people are like, all of my family documents are in Persian. One yeah. dude messaged me saying, my family in history is written in Persian. <laughs> Yeah. So, but then you guys get cut off, and I don't want to ramble too much. But then you you have English now, yeah. And then what happens is you don't have Persian, and you have English, and yeah. then you also we have this the inferiority complex. So then I get people saying Coleman Barks is really popular in Pakistan and India, and it's just like yeah. my mind is blown. It doesn't it doesn't I, make sense. It made it, no sense. It you're you're very right. You're, you're 
you're hitting on a very important point because when I was studying uh, Iqbal and Ghalib's poetry, I was studying it in, in an English form, which was basically it's, it was written in Urdu or Persian, and mm-hmm. that's what that's when I was like, wait a minute, why is it in Persian? Why does Ghalib and Iqbal mm-hmm. have poetry that's in Persian? Ghalib once said that my poetry in its truest form is best in Persian, and mm-hmm. Urdu poetry is something that I do as a hobby. Like my poetry and its best form is in Persian, mm-hmm. and I always thought. Well, Ghalib lived in Mughal-ruled mm-hmm. India, and Iqbal lived in Mughal-ruled India. How are they? How do they have access to right. that kind of language? And now, like once I started going down that rabbit hole, it made sense that once the English came and it, like English became the second language of of mm-hmm. that region, Persian was just sort of eradicated from that right. la- yeah. from that part of the world, Th- and we sort of lost a, a heritage, our history because right, of that. Right. This is a big cultural erasure. And one thing I think, unfortunately, we tend to measure our losses in our experience with colonization in monetary. So, for yeah. example, people say it wasn't, it wasn't India. It was more South Asia. You know, we didn't have these yeah, like, yeah. Na- national identities quite yet. Yeah, yeah. South Asia, when the British arrived, was 25% of the world's economy. This is a very common yeah. statistic. I feel like not everyone knows this. And when yeah. they left, it was 2%, right? Yeah. And that's just a response. People say, oh, they built railroads and things like that. And that is a tragedy. But... India will return to being a representative portion of the world economy. And by India, I mean the yeah. historical. So Pakistan, Bangladesh, the yeah. historical lands. They, yeah. will, they will recoup economically in the long term. Yeah. And they, they already have a, an amazing growth. That's not, yeah. a, that's not a worry. What we will never get back is the irreversible cultural, emotional damage, stealing, erasure. We'll never get that back. Yeah. It, it pains me. I wish. But I don't think South Asia will ever be Persian teaching, speaking again. It's just the reality yeah. of life, you know. It's sad, but it's and we can't get that back. So I think that's ultimately the the biggest tragedy that they took from us. And it's interesting that the languages thing nowadays. Again, I'm always railing against nationalism. We have this idea of national language yeah. that every country has like a language and everyone speaks yeah. it. So in yeah. Iran, it's Persian, but only fifty percent of Iranians speak Persian natively. Yeah. The other fifty percent don't. In in Iraq, they have Arabic, but so many there's so many Kurds, and I won't even yeah. get into Turkey. I'll probably never be allowed in the country. But <laughs> and then in Pakistan, for example, famously, you know, Urdu is the national language, but only eight percent of you guys speak yeah. the language. We Everyone have like, else. Yeah, you're right. We have so, so many sub languages that right, are more dominant. Yeah, you have you know Punjabi, Sindhi, yeah, Sindhi Sarai, whatever, Balochi, yeah, Sarai, Balochi. Yeah. These, these are this is a made up idea that one yeah. country has one language and yeah. in our historical societies we had so many languages so usually the way it works is i'll give you the ottoman example because yeah. i know it the best turkish was the speaking language just normal yeah. everyday day speech they said amiya ami means for the yeah. people yeah. arabic was the administrative language that meant the paperwork you know government bureaucracy religious khutbas you know prayer yeah persian was the poetic language yeah. so if you were in the court and the vizier wanted to give a, a statement about something, maybe it'd be in Arabic. And if you wanted to crack yeah. a joke, it could be in Turkish. And if you wanted to yeah. sing a poem, I'm sorry, it would be in Persian. So yeah. the same thing was the case in South Asia, where the Mughals came. They were Turkic, but they were yeah. Persianized, and they were Muslim, yeah. so they knew Arabic. Yep. Now, what happened was Arabic remained. Obviously, this day in South Asia, the Mughals know Arabic. Persian yeah. was the poetic language. And then you had the, the spoken language, which we call today Urdu. Yeah. It comes from Zabone Urdu Mu'alla, which in Persian yeah. means the language of the exalted camp or the group. So yeah. their spoken language was a mix of Turkic, Persian, Arabic, and the local uh, South, uh, South Asian origin, Hindi origin, yeah. Hindustani, we would say. Yeah. And ultimately, that's where rich linguistic diversity comes from. But we've totally lost it. And, yep. and this is a big loss, I think, ultimately. I mean, you speak about the woes of losing Persian. I speak about the woes of losing Urdu as... as mm-hmm. Okay, Urdu in itself is such a beautiful language. It's the it used to be the language, as you said, of the common people, but now it's sort of turned into this high mm-hmm. romantic language in 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 Pakistan or in, in that part of the world where where poetry, if you want to express love, we use it through we 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 speak um, Urdu poems and all that, and right. sort of fading away with the whole Westernization mm-hmm. of of that region of that part of the world. I I don't know if my kids will speak Urdu in right, like 20 yeah. years and it's 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 a sad thing because i feel like we once you start losing that heritage that that part of you that speaks that language you sort of are now you all water down into this homogenous gel of just right. everybody exactly. speaking english exactly. and everybody just, just yeah. healing that as as the this language the of the problem, world yeah. Every I mean, year, I, like, I'm sorry every year more languages go extinct and more yeah. languages are added to the endangered list yeah 
I mean, you. But the, at the same time, you you'll see something, so uh, a, a superpower like like China that has not lost its heritage. It, it, they whatever happens in the world, they speak Chinese. They they revere that language. They promote that language. It's something that they really hold right. very close to themselves, and they don't want to lose touch of that part of them. Right, right. Um, I don't know, but that also has to go to the how economically strong China is and yeah. how. It's basically the world, one of the world powers of the world. I don't know when we will become that, but until mm-hmm. and unless that happens, I feel like our mm-hmm. heritage is in is in danger right, as well. Right. Yeah. It, it's it sounds crazy. You know, people say how many hundreds of millions of people speak Urdu. I mean, not yeah. as a native language, but they speak yeah. it. Yeah. How could it ever fade away? But you know, when English becomes the world's language, there will be less and less utility, less and less use for these languages, and they will slowly yeah. fade away. And that's just a sad future that we're going to have to face. But ultimately, it's not just economic power. I think it's the mindset of the people. Yeah. Because like you said, China, Chinese is not going to get replaced, uh, Mandarin yeah. Chinese. And even if we look at the example of Israel, I know we're Muslims, not not yeah. defending Israel at all as a state, yeah, but yeah. Just, just strictly what they did with Hebrew. Hebrew was yeah. a dead, officially a dead language. Yeah, they, the priests knew it, kind of like how priests, yeah. I mean, the... The Kahans, the um, the rabbis, but kind of like the rabbis. Latin Catholic priests know Latin. That doesn't mean it's a living language. Yeah. But they actually revived Hebrew. They went the other way. It died, yeah. and they remade it. So if you have my example is again not to defend them, but as a, as a state. But if you have enough will, yeah. you can make it happen. But it's it has yeah. to do with the will. You really have to want it. We have Amish people in America that still speak a dialect of German that's archaic. We have. Yeah. Fifth, sixth, seventh generation Ashkenazi Orthodox Jews who still speak yeah. Yiddish and they they sp- speak it better than English to the extent yeah. that when their grand rabbi has a meeting with the mayor of New York City, he needs a translator from Yiddish into English. Yeah. So suffice to say, we can make it happen. We just have the, yeah. we need the will and we need the cultural uh, consciousness or the collective consciousness, let's say. I think this is a very, st- like it starts from us, right? So it's a very good initiative that you are sort of taking Thank this you. on upon yourself. I wanted to talk more about you. You're a very interesting character yourself. Yeah. How did you study linguistics or did you study Islam or, or, or Persian in, in university? What is your background with the language and how did you get into this? Sure. Okay. So I'll start a little earlier than university because it has to do with the language. I grew up speaking Persian at home with my parents yeah. and grandparents and ultimately the reason I know it so well is because of my grandparents. They don't yeah. know any English till this day. Only one of them survives. My grandmother recently passed away. But they don't know any English. So we have to speak yeah. to them in Farsi. So when we'd be at home, if I spoke in English, they didn't get it. So I would just have to switch. And this is yeah. an issue with language retention I've noticed. Is that if the parents know English, the kids the kids are smart. We think they're dumb, yeah. but they know that we understand. Yeah. So they just get lazy and speak English. Anyway, I knew that they didn't understand. So I had to speak Farsi. But yeah. that only got me to a certain colloquial level. And anyone who speaks Urdu, Arabic, Farsi knows that it's one thing to speak the language, but it's one thing to know the poetry. It's not yeah. like in English. There are two yeah. different worlds for our Muslim language. Yeah. Two different worlds. So I knew the, I knew the colloquial Persian. And I, I knew how to like recognize the letters. I knew the Quran and stuff, but I couldn't read yeah. and write by any means, right? And yeah. Anyone who can read Quran knows it's different than reading and writing your mother tongue. Yeah. So then I'm in, in, when I was 15, 16, I wanted to move back to Iran. I didn't like my school in America. I had a lot of issues. I wanted to go. I wanted to live with my grandparents again. They had moved back by that time. And when I went to Iran, I really improved my Persian there. And I also got yeah. introduced to Omar Khayyam, who was the first poet I read. He writes very yeah. basic, short, simple poetry. And I like the message. And then when I went to university, I thought, okay, time to get a job. I have to, you know. So you went to university in Iran or you went no, to university in America? In the States? I came back for the okay. university of Michigan, I should clarify. And I decided to study economics. It was the only uh, subject I liked in high school in Iran. I, yeah. I don't know why. It doesn't really, you can just kind of tell it doesn't fit with me. But I studied it. <laughs> and one year in, I went to, uh, I saw just a sign as I was walking. It said, Iranian Americans, you know, speech about something. I said, my university? Because I, I, I went to a small campus of the University of Michigan in an Arab city. Yeah. The University of Michigan Dearborn, where there's like no Iranians. Yeah. yeah. The, the central one had Iranians uh, there. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll just walk right in. So I walked right in. It was just about to start, just random luck of the draw. Yeah. And a guy was giving a speech. His name was uh, Cameron Amin. I'll never forget him. Shout out Professor Amin. He said, oh, by the way, we're looking for a research assistant who's fluent in Persian and English yeah. for like interviews and transcripts and stuff. And I thought, oh, I need a job. I'll do it. So I yeah. met him and he said, you know, why don't you do some Middle East studies classes? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So I started with him doing Middle East studies classes. And I was like, oh, I like this stuff. It's I'm completely interested. opposite from economics, though. Right, <laughs> yeah. And then every summer I'd visit Iran, and I realized that my passion was things related to Iran and the Middle East and the Muslim world. Yeah. And, you know, the more I visited, the more I took classes, the more I realized, wow, I'm not so interested in economics. Yeah. 
But then when I transferred to the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, it has a bigger course selection. I studied yeah. Persian uh, with uh, Professor Cameron Cross, so classical Persian, not the Persian yeah. of, you know, even modern Iran, but the stuff in, you know, these ancient books by, uh, by Rumi. So, like, the Persian you'd find in this book. Not in oh, an wow. average book, yeah. The Masnavi, yeah. Yeah, the Masnavi, exactly. So hard, hard Persian, let's say, for yeah. one year. And then I also did other Middle East studies classes. I learned about Orientalism. I learned about translation methodology, things like that. We, we did, I took a class where we were just translating Persian poems, and we were, he was criticizing or critiquing. That's ultimately, it was a huge help for this project. So I, I cannot thank uh, those professors, Cameron Amin and Cameron Cross, two comrades. Yep. <laughs> and um, <laughs> when I finished university, I realized I do not want to do economics, but I had an yeah. opportunity. I won a scholarship to go to the University of Jordan for a year. So there I went and studied Arabic, and I studied Sufism. I'd studied Sufism in Iran in the Persian yeah. context. I studied in more of an Arab context with Iraqi Sufis, and yeah. I started learning some Arabic poetry. So yeah, that's, that's more or less like my background uh, as far as poetry and, and Islamic studies and things like that goes. That's very interesting, because if you, like we were talking about finding a will to, to sort of uh, like maintain the language and pres preserve it. You sort of have, even if it was happenstance, you sort of found a way to go back to your roots and find your heritage. Right. What would you recommend people like me or pe people who are interested in this, where should they start from? Where should they go? I think the best thing to do, if it's within your means, you know, politically, illegally, whatever, financially, to travel back yeah. to your own country and also to other Muslim countries. Because there's ultimately so much you can in you can get from talking to elders in your mosque or books, movies, whatever. The big, the best experience is to just be there and feel it and yeah. talk to the people. Because that will connect you emotionally and in a space and time way that just reading a book cannot connect you. You know, yeah. the smells, the sights, the vibes, you know, everything there. It connects you in a way that it makes you feel like you're a part of it. And yeah. also not just to visit your home country because I'd visited Iran, let's say, like 10 times before I started visiting other parts of the Muslim world. But also visit other parts of the Muslim world because within our national boundaries and with our nationalism, we, we think I'm Pakistani, I'm Iranian, I'm Afghan, yeah. I'm Iraqi, and that's just me. Yeah. But, you know, when I, when I traveled, I felt when I was in Amman or in Cairo, I felt, you know, this could have been any other street in Tehran as well. Yeah, people sound and look a bit different, yeah. but, you know, everything's more or less the same, right? Yeah. I went to the Sayyidina Hussain uh, shrine in Cairo uh, where the Fatimids claim Imam Hussain's remains were buried. And it felt like any, sh any shrine in Iran. And yeah. So I felt that, you know, traveling is kind of like a lost thing. We need to travel more. And, and if you read our, our history, this was always a part of the Muslim world. People were constantly traveling. Yeah from one part to the other. So yep. I think traveling back to where your roots are from, and then also if that's possibility, secondary possibilities to travel to other major centers of the Muslim world, Istanbul, Cairo, yeah. you know, inshallah in the future, Baghdad and Damascus, when yeah. it Delhi, if you can go Karachi, things like that. Yeah, my grandfather always used to say that if you really want to know what the world is like, you should travel or read. Those are the two uh, ways yeah. to truly experience the human condition. Definitely. What is, what is happening with the uh, Persian poetics uh, thing now you have you started a patreon yet is are people sort of pushing towards the, your translations of Rumi right so <laughs> at first I'll go back I for a while was just doing this as like a side thing if you yeah. look really far back I don't know if the timestamps get that specific like Twitter or something on Instagram but yeah. it might say like so many weeks but I used to post like once every week once every three days sometimes yeah. it would be for like 10 days because I had yeah. school I had a job I, it was just like a for fun thing I would get like 50 yeah. likes 100 likes like whatever it's here's a yeah. poem out there but then as I started, you know, getting more traction, I someone said, just open up a Patreon. And I did. And I got, like, a, like two Patreon supporters. And I was like, all right, yeah. this is nice. Maybe I can, like, buy a book with this money after a month, yeah. or, like a year or something. <laughs> when I go to Iran, I'll buy a, a jild of Rumi's book or something. Yeah. So <laughs> I put it up there. And then I started to get more and more support. A few more people supported me. And then I created a group chat. I was like, okay, this is, like, a cool thing. We can talk to them. And people started throwing out ideas, you know, get active on Twitter or whatever. And I was like, you know, who uses Twitter? That's where the ranting yeah. and the memes are. Why, why should I put a poetry there? I mean, it's hilarious that I thought that considering the state yeah. of where we're at now, right? Yeah. So then ultimately, as I was getting closer to graduating and I came back from Jordan, I thought, look, I wish that I could do this full time. I wish I could yeah. write a book. But it seems like I'm going to have to get a job. This is not going to work. But then all of a sudden, alhamdulillah, the Twitter thread blew up. And then now, yes, there is a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Persian Poetics. It's, it's the main link yep. usually on the Instagram page. You guys can find it if anyone's viewing and seeing my work or sees my work and is interested. And if you support, you can get added to a group chat where we, we post the poems that are for, forthcoming from the Rumi book. Yep. And there's also a discussions group chat where we just talk back and forth about anything. 
So there is that. But ultimately, if there is enough Patreon support, which it looks like, alhamdulillah, there is, there is going to be enough. I'm planning yep. to move away. So right now I'm living in my family house in, the, yep. in America. But, uh, you know, life is too expensive here for that. So yep. inshallah, I'm going to pick a part of the Muslim world that's relatively inexpensive, maybe Istanbul or Tehran and move yep. and just focus on the Rumi book full time. Yep. You know, God willing, with, with sufficient support, because there's 2000 poems in one section of the book that I want to translate called the Quatrains. Yep. They've never been translated into poetry before, yeah. right? They've, there's a there's like a, a literal translation, but it's it's only really useful for someone like me to be, to yeah. be frank. So I'm I'm translating a rate of ten poems a day, and with two thousand poems, it should only take about two hundred days. So in yeah. I'm thinking the next phase of this project will be two hundred days of straight translating, and maybe in the last month I'll start contacting publishers. And we've already alhamdulillah we've already figured out cover artwork, and people are sending us resources and things like that. But that's yeah. ultimately the next phase is trying to push full time ahead on this project of translating this book. Because someone said, you know, why don't you release a book of like the essential Rumi, but correct. Yeah. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to make it that about that much about Barks. I want to just translate everything so that all the poems from the essential Rumi are in there, but everything yeah. is also in there. Yeah. So inshallah, ta'ala, like, the book is about this thick. I think in English, the, it'll be about this thick. And I'm, I'm yeah. guessing it'll be about 600, 700 pages. Yeah. And it'll be everything. So it'll be yeah. your one-stop shop. There's no need for the essential barks, a big red book, whatever, a million yeah. books. And some people told me, you know, release it in 10 parts or whatever, 100 pages. No, I don't, yeah. I don't feel like doing it. I just want to drop it and say, no, Here, that's, here's Rumi yeah. in English. Here's the best modern version. There you go, Muslim. There you go. Yeah. One thing I've noticed about the way that you translate is you keep the essence of the poetry in it as well. As, as a poet myself, I see it. I, I read Coleman Barks, but I read it more as because um, he doesn't know the, the essence of the poetry. Right, so I read right. it more like, uh, like you said, literal translation. The way that you're translating is you can see the w flow and the movement of the words and how, how they're sort of they're trying their best to encapsulate the Farsi Right, right, version yeah. of the poem and I, I really I really appreciate that that's thank really good thank you so much yeah anyone who's familiar with the ghazals and the robais the four line yeah. and, and the longer like yep. love poem format knows that part of the beauty is the rhyme so I think it's a yeah. shame when we see translations with no rhyme feels like it's, especially the robai Rumi's robais you know Rumi's he's not writing love poems he's writing poems with a lesson you know the poems yeah. you notice and ultimately part of the point the, the direction is that there's two rhyming lines and then a third line that doesn't rhyme and the last yep. line that rhymes the two lines yep. are the exposition the third line is the one thing and the last line is like the funny final point you know yeah, what I mean yeah it's like the punch the punchline the punchline but but yeah. that no rhyme and then the last line rhyming with the first two that's part of the flow of the poem to make yeah. it punch so yeah. if that's not there then it's less it's not as nice so yeah and, and it makes it hard you know part of it is I think the laziness because I can translate or any Rumi poem like a four-line poem with no rhyme yeah. in like 10 minutes. It's not yeah. that hard. You just read, check the word, make sure that you're reading it correctly, check the, the commentary, yeah. done. To add in the rhyme, that can take up to an hour of just staring, yeah. reworking, no, singing it in your head, looking at the yeah. Persian again. So I think ultimately that's what that's why I'm, I'm asking really for Patreon support and for people to share the work and yeah. to help me in any way they can help this project is because it's going to take a lot of time. You know, one year isn't a joke. One year no. of full-time work to translate yeah. just this book. <laughs> yeah. It's not no, for sure. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to drop the, uh, the links in the, in the bio as well. So for thank sure, you. people are going to yeah. support. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, or Mohammed, I should me. say. I keep, we keep, uh, even the, the names, we keep going to the Western dialect <laughs> right. of it. So, Mo, Mohammed, thank Mohammed, you very much. Yeah. Mo, yeah, Momo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mohammed, course, for uh, taking me. the time out. This was I learned a lot from this conversation. Thank Being, you. I enjoyed I, it so much. I thought I thought I was a student of the poetry of the poems as well, but I learned so many other things that I wouldn't have just by hearing You're you. You're too kind, man. Um, You're so kind. Thank you for your time, and uh, for having me. I hope to see that uh, Rumi collection coming in soon. Thank you, Inshallah. Inshallah. Alaikum. Alaikum salam. फिर से सारी बातें जो नहीं करनी थी कर डाली माँ